Welcome to Thrive Guys, episode 23. This week, we're going to talk about marginal gains. Let's get into it. Hello, Dan. Hello, mate. How are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. And yourself? I am... I'm pleased to see you. So Siri, apparently... Even Siri is happy. Like, Siri is happy that we're here. That's... It's just picked up. I'm very good, thank you. And yourself, <laughs> I am. You're welcome. So, yeah, it's very nice to see you in person for... Other than at climbing. I normally I see you in your sweaty gym pants. I know, I know. When I'm, when I'm hating life and... Uh, well, loving life, but also feeling the pain of, uh, of the climb. So what's been going on in your week this week? Uh, I've moved house. Right, okay. And it has been tumultuous, the end. <laughs> I don't <laughs> want to talk about it. Tumultuous. Yeah, I do not want to talk about it. It's, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've moved stuff about. I've moved box after box. We took our white goods with us, so that's moving the freezer, that's okay, moving wow. the fridge, moving the washing machine, tumble dryer, you know, all that stuff. So um, it's not been very nice. But we're in. But so, you're in. Yeah. What's that phrase you say? It, the juice was worth the squeeze. The juice was that's, worth the squeeze. Yeah, phrase. exactly. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. I'm full of them. Oh, no. I'm full of little crazy sayings. At least like yours that. makes sense. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. I'm I'm really pleased that you've uh, you've gone through this journey actually quite quickly. You know, it didn't actually take you very long to go from um, zero to one hundred. <laughs> zero to one to over nine thousand. Right. Um, it was a very quick process and actually you know getting it done when you got it done meant that you um were able to sort of you know squirrel a little bit more away f- on the stamp duty side of things so dan why don't you tell us what you spent that money on or what you spent a a portion of that money on let's say uh, i convinced kerry to get an oled tv <sighs> i'm so jealous i'm so jealous looks like a painting on the wall it's really really nice yeah I'd- but I don't have internet, so I haven't been able to watch anything decent. I've got nothing on my memory stick. Other than, as I was telling you a minute ago, I've got The Last Samurai. Um, the Last like, Samurai. I don't know what year that film came out. I think if we can just bring that up, I actually am curious to see when The Last Samurai came out. What What I don't understand is of all of the films, like of all of the films that you could possibly have like <laughs> cached in your Netflix like as a download, because I, I think downloads only last like two days or something I think something I must like have that. clicked it on the night before we'd moved, you know, when you just like, I was like, I need something on there and it's the only one that hasn't expired. Hmm. So I, I literally just went through a list and was just like, tick, tick, tick. And that's, I went to log in and plug my iPad in for, maybe we can watch a film. It's from 2003, so I'm really not going to get the benefit of the quality. No, you're really not. <laughs> I mean, may, maybe they did retrospectively kind of release it in 4K, HDR, um 60 frames a second yeah maybe probably not though i mean that is like what an 18 year old film there are there are there are there are people in jobs who are (laughs) younger than that film right that's just to give you some context it's a great film though if you do get a chance to watch Uh, it maybe well you can pop around mine later i've got it downloaded so (laughs) well yeah it's like oh should we watch have have i got the film for you guys (laughs) i basically can't say that it's a bad film because you're not going to come around at that point. If I say, well, I've got I've got a wide selection of movies. Do you want to come around and watch it? And then you look at the iPad. There it is, The Last Samurai. Do you know what? I think I'd actually just rather watch the demo of the of whatever oh. the, the TV demo is on. It's really it's an nice. LG, it's called, um, yeah, it's called like art mode. Um, and it just cycles through different paintings and plays some relaxing music. And I know that because I've had it on all the time. So Yeah, because you've got nothing else to watch. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so where are we today, Joe? Uh, we are in my office. So um, one of the things that we are able to do now is see each other in person, right? That's a fundamental thing that's mm. different to where things were before we started Thrive Guys. And so we thought we'd give a bit of a trial run to doing this podcast sort of face-to-face. And uh, it, it's a little bit hodgepodge, a little bit put together, but it seems to work. We're we're filming now. We we we. This is the second episode that we're doing now, um, where we've got kind of a video component to the podcast, and yeah, I mean, so far so good. It took us what, like half an hour, thirty five minutes to set this up. Yeah, and most of that time was spent moving stuff out of shot. Yeah, literally, like my Pringles cans <laughs> that were there and uh, are now down there. Just friend outside. of the show, spicy barbecue Pringles. <laughs> I can't get enough of them. I really can't. <laughs> so before I left, this is one of the things I'm gutted about. Before I left um, my old house, they were one pound sixty five in the shop across the road. Oh, it's a bargain. Down from like, I think they're honestly going they're between three quid. Three quid yeah. yeah. 
So I stocked up. And they're so spicy, but so good. They're delicious. Yeah, I, I think that's Kerry's got um, chap lips at the moment because of maybe the stress. But I'm just going to say it's because of the Pringles, to be honest. Well, there there has been another. Um, what's the best way of putting it? There has been another casualty, another fatality in the <laughs> Joe Page things I love to eat oh, far yeah. too much of. Yeah. So the first casual, I've never spoken about this before, but it's something that is kind of dear to my heart and, and something that I feel like needs to be shared with the world. In the UK supermarkets, there was uh, a type of vegan sausage from uh, Tofurky, which is this Italian mm. herby sun, to sun-dried myself. tomato sausage. And it is flipping delicious, right? They disappeared. They're no longer being sold anywhere. And I was gutted because literally every week we would have sausage pasta, which is, I think my, sausage, I don't think, yeah. it's, it's basically spaghetti bolognese, but instead of the mince, it's these sausages. And they were delightful. The, the second casualty of my culinary escapades, I guess, is the Snyder's of Hanover mm, jalapeno mm, mm, pretzel mm. bites. I've only tried them once. You've literally had two of them in your entire life. And you were like, I love these. So and good. then the next week they were gone. You cannot buy them I told anywhere. Told you we're living in a simulation. As soon as I like something, they go bin it. I'm never going <laughs> to show you anything true again. Dan. I'm never going to show you anything <laughs> again. It's just it's it's it costs me too much. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so that's that's kind of probably one of the fundamental things that happened this week. The the other thing that I just wanted to share with everybody was um, I made another purchase. I do lots of I seem to buy a lot of things to pass the time these days, and actually. Um, I bounced off of. I'll show them on the uh, on the video side of things. I bounced off of these AirPods Max um, a number of times because they were quite expensive. They're like five hundred and fifty pounds. I'm sorry. Um, what? Yeah, they are five hundred and fifty pounds retail. And um, I you got three pounds off, so you thought mm-hmm. three pounds Let's off. Do it, yeah. That's a cup of coffee, Dan. You know, that's a cup of coffee, Dan, that I didn't have before, but. They were significantly more than three pounds off. And I've been coveting them for a while. And the space gray ones on Amazon UK at the moment are a hundred pounds off. And so I thought, do you know what? It's the end of end of the, the financial year. Treat yourself. Treat yourself. Yeah. So and they're amazing. Mm. They're genuinely amazing. One one of my favorite features is um the the transparency mode. Yeah. Where essentially you press a button and it removes all of the um the noise cancelling but it also removes all of the kind of passive noise cancelling that you get by putting headphones I love on seeing your so you hands talking everything. about this where you're saying the transparency that just removes everything it's like yeah. the transformer it literally is like that. it's amazing <laughs> it's like super having superhuman hearing it's pretty That's incredible awesome. um i was told yesterday by kaylee that um I wasn't allowed to wear them all the time because I literally wore them the entire day. And every time I went to talk to Kaylee, I'd just be like, boop. Yeah, hi, yeah. And I'd just speak normally. She'd be like, can you take those off? Eventually, so. Apple are going to release a, like a helmet and that's it. When she comes in, you just tap it and it... Yep, I'm like here. Iron Man. Exactly. That, and I you think I'm not going to wear that. Take my money. Yeah, just exactly. take it. I'm going to um, buy four of them. <clears throat> so, yeah. So that that's kind of... That's probably the most exciting thing that happened. Well, actually, it's not the most exciting thing that happened this week, but um, it's still a pretty cool thing. Have you got anything you want to share before we jump into win of the week? No, I'm exhausted. It's been a, <laughs> uh, there's loads of stuff that I've accomplished this week, nice. house-wise, right? But it's it's not for the podcast. I can go on all day about you know lifting five times my body weight <clears throat> to get it in the house. <laughs> and ant goals, yeah. right? Yeah, excellent. <laughs> well, shall we do win of the week then? Yes, let's fantastic. Do it. So. Win of the week is a segment at the top of each show where we get to share something that's happened this week that we would like to celebrate just to make sure we start our conversation on a positive note. Because me and Dan, we're proper neggy. You know, mm. we are very negative people and we need a reminder every week of where we've won. So look, we are really excited to, to talk about our wins and we'd love to hear about your wins as well. So if you have a win that you want to share with us, we do send a reminder out on our platforms every Friday. But if you'd like to share it with us anytime, just uh, tag us in your post at Thrive Guys Pod on Twitter, Instagram or whatever, uh, or with your hashtag win of the week. And if we remember, we will uh, we will read them. So, Dan, why don't you share your win of the week with us first and then I'll share mine. Awesome. So my win of the week was moving house. But as I said, I don't Can't really have want that. to go into that. Spoken yeah, exactly. about that. So. so my second win of the week <laughs> is involving a um, friend of the show, Beth Gentle, um, okay. to do some of our like marketing stuff because we've got back some really cool content already. Um, and I just think that's a win being able to delegate stuff, you know, 
parts of the show to someone else and just put full trust in someone. Yeah, I think agreed. We kind of so for for our listeners, we kind of toyed with the idea of running a TikTok, but me and Joe are past thirty. I'm thirty at the end of this month. Um, Joe's I don't know how old you are anymore. Seven hundred, yeah. it might as well be to be honest. <laughs> I because I've told this story before. Um, I'm a bit of a luddite when it comes to social media. I think I started posting Instagram post things on on our Instagram. And I posted a video like a, a, of a clip of our show. And it just, I did an IGTV video, like accidentally. <laughs> I was like, what have I done? How have I done that? I don't even know what that is, right? Because <laughs> I took like a two year break from social media. So I jumped back on it. It's like, there's all of these things. Like, I, taking a step back, I feel like over the last couple of weeks, I am at the point now where everything is unfamiliar in life. Mm hmm. Everything is confusing and I don't like any of it. And I want things to be back the way they were. And I genuinely, I, when I say that, I'm like, oh my God, I'm my dad. That's I am I'm literally saying. my just, dad. It happens. I, I don't have a TikTok. And that's when I was, I was speaking to Beth and I was like, what can we do? Like, we, we just want to build traction. Like, yeah. we, we've got into the, you know, we're good at the process now. We know how to record. Yeah. We know how to plan our content and stuff like that. But when it comes to getting people to listen, no idea it's beyond me yeah my girlfriend works in marketing Kerry obviously works in marketing um, and Beth does social media so I was like I'm just going to delegate because we'll get yeah. much better results from people that know what they're doing as oh, opposed to sure. us fumbling around just going yeah. do you know what we can work this out which we probably could but it's the hassle of doing it um, so yeah my win is involving Beth I think that's um, a really good step forward for us and I'm excited to see what happens uh, I am too I think some of the some of the kind of the the content that um she's already put together for us has been leaps and bounds better than what we've done and um honestly it's you know it was still you know we want to try and get our voice out there and yeah you know, i think we've got the the operation side of things mm. kind of nailed but we just need the sales and marketing more the marketing bit there yeah. like nailed and that's neither of our wheelhouses to be honest with you especially when it comes to social media i mean you can sell that merch oh yeah i can sell our, our thrive guys merch which is um a limited run of one at the <laughs> no, moment there's two i've got one. Oh, do you have one as I well have one, yeah. oh nice i didn't know I ordered that. it a couple of weeks after i was like that does look cool amazing excellent yeah so maybe one day we'll we'll let other people buy them from us but uh but maybe not yet um, similar price to those apple head um headphones i think <laughs> yeah, that's what i've been yeah. hearing for the low low price yeah. of uh 549 dollars. limited edition <laughs> yeah exactly well um I have a, a win that I'd like to share, and uh, I guess it is a pretty significant win. And it's not just a win from this week; it's a win that's kind of kind of been, uh, what's the word, sort of gestating over time. Uh, but I got a promotion at work. <laughs> The words you use, I, think I always think you're edging towards some other news that you haven't told the listeners yet. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, good point, but no. Every week you sort of lean on it. I lean on it and then I take it away. No, I've got a, this is the, my win this week. I mean, you should read my notes, mate. This is, this is, know. you'll know what's coming. Is, yeah, so I got a promotion at work where I'm now, I'm managing a team of four people, which is pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, I mean, I've I've been on somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> I've been on somewhat of a trial over the last kind of six months, uh, working with just one other person, and uh, the work that we've done together has gone really well. And um, yeah, he's kind of taken off in terms of the results that um, were expected of, of kind of the the trial. So I guess I passed the test, which is pretty mm -hmm. cool. cool. And um, yeah, I'm really excited about the whole piece. And I'm excited about adding this additional challenge of being a leader as well as kind of being a quota carrying salesperson. So I've, I've kind of taken on an additional role mm -hmm. as, as almost like a team leader. Um, but I still have a kind of core set of customers that I need to be, I need to be kind of selling to and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to add a, add a whole new dynamic to my job, but also probably give me lots more to talk about on here as well. Cause I'm yeah. going to have to kind of broaden my, I guess my reading and my, sphere of interest management 101 yeah exactly yeah so you know i always think about the content mate always thinking about the exactly content. you can have a notion page for each of your delegates yeah i've done it already actually <coughs> of course you have yeah that's exactly so, how i would have done it i would have had a page for all of my quote unquote employees and i'd say here's your you know use it and if they're oh, like, no. i'm not using notion i say off yeah so i've not gone quite that far because i can't mandate um i'm not 
I'm not a Führer. So what's Can't the point mandate. then? Well, no, what you don't have the power yet. Mm, well, yeah, it's, nearly there. <laughs> it's it's just in title only. You know, it's a, it's a meaningless promotion basically. <laughs> no, so so what I've done is just to kind of um, to I guess just to kind of give you a peek behind the curtain. I've essentially created like a team home mm. page, and then within the team home page, I've um, created each individual, and then. Every time I have a catch up with them, which is an action item, yeah. I'll take notes of that um, that conversation. I'll say, you know, we'll talk about a deal and I'll say, why don't you try this? And they'll go, yeah, yeah, okay. And then the next catch up, I can go look at all the backlinks yeah. to the, all of those other conversations and go, and so I remind myself, okay, I told you, I, I suggested on that deal that we do this. Did you do it kind of thing? And then we can kind of review whether that worked or not. That's what I so, do in my internal meetings whenever I have a meeting with someone i always just yeah. put like the date of it and what the content was and then i'll put like my notes in it so i can yeah. always refer back so i yeah no i appreciate that i think that's wicked yeah and so, congratulations yeah thank you very from, much from myself and from the two listeners well there's only one listener now because you you employed the other one so, oh, yeah. oh, so now maybe i need i need an ocean page for beth yeah friend of the show beth gentle yeah yeah there we go so today's topic uh, I'm really excited to talk about today's topic and we are going to essentially take a bit of a departure from software and we're going to talk about process. We're going mm. to talk about a principle, a philosophy. And I was inspired to raise this as a topic following being reminded of um, the chapter in James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. Mm -hmm. um, and I was reminded by Kaylee that because uh, she's reading it, well, she was reading it um, a couple of weeks ago. She just finished it. She loved the book, um, and it was on my recommendation that um, that she'd read it. And there's a kind of a, t a part of um, James's book which talks about marginal gains. And so some of you might be asking, "What the woof is marginal gains? What does that mean?" Well, don't worry, dear listener. Today we are going to go through the whole kit and caboodle. We're going to talk about what is the marginal gain principle and why is it kind of interesting and exciting to us. And then we're going to talk about any of our examples on, you know, have we got any examples of how we've implemented marginal gains in our own lives and in our own kind of professional, personal endeavors, whichever. And then we're going to kind of signpost or kind of brainstorm any additional things that we could do using the marginal gains principle in the future that may make us more effective, make us more kind of uh, better at you know, either something in our professional lives or something in our personal lives. <clears throat> so I thought I'd start with just setting the scene in terms of what is the marginal gains principle and where did it come from? Mm -hmm. And then I'd be quite keen to hand over to you to talk about some of the ways that you might have implemented this principle in your life and then we'll kind of you know, yeah, yeah. Do, do what we usually do and do a dj dj kind of thing <laughs> and then uh, and then we'll wrap up DJ. yeah dj dj exactly so you know what is what is the marginal gains principle where does it come from so essentially the marginal gains principle is the notion of assessing each detailed aspect of a craft or your passion or you know, your job or whatever it might be and making lots of tiny improvements in lots of different areas, which on their own wouldn't make a kind of difference in and of themselves. They wouldn't make a meaningful sort of step towards your, your end result. But actually, when they're kind of consolidated and aggregated t together, they make much, much... The, the value of them is mm. worth much, much more than the sum of their parts. And in turn, they make a massive difference. And I first heard about this... And I think this is where the kind of the principle is 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 sort of derived from. This is the person who either made it up or who is credited at bringing it to the masses. Um, I first heard about this when I was told a story about the head coach of the British cycling team. Yeah. So th there's this guy who, um, this guy, Sir his name Dave is Sir Brailsford. David Brailsford. He's, he's <laughs> got a knighthood, some guy. Yeah. Um, geezer down the pub, managed yeah, the yeah, cycling some team. Some geezer called Dave. Um, he's credited with coming up with this principle. Um, or, well, as I say, at least bringing it to the masses and in particular into the business world. And I love his story. So I'm going to tell the, the kind of the yeah. story in bullet points. Um, but I will link to the excerpt of James Clear's book that goes into a lot more detail mm -hmm. on it. And um, it's actually a really interesting story. So um, back in 2003, 
British cycling was not in a good place. In fact, the the this is what makes me laugh. The performance of the British riders had been so like underwhelming, essentially, that all of the top bike manufacturers didn't want to work with them. They're like, nah, we're, we're fine. We're not going to yeah. give you any bikes because you know, we don't want to be associated with, with <laughs> giving the British cycling team all of this kit for them then to just kind of be underwhelming yeah. and not really win about it. So it was not in a good place back then. And the whoever it was that made the decision drafted Sir David in to um, try and save the club, to try and turn things around. And it was the, the reason why they picked him was because of his dedication to the philosophy of marginal gains, which um, in this example is breaking down everything you could think of that goes into riding a bike effectively and then improve it by 1%. So looking at everything that goes into riding a bike, everything that goes into that those athletes' lives and just making a 1% improvement each, each day, each week, each mm-hmm. month, etc., And then as a result, when you smush them all together, and that's the technical term for it, you get a significant increase um, over where you were before. So it's not like making like a massive change to try and generate different results, but it's just tickling things along here, there, and here, and there, and here, and there. Loads of small changes for big results from multiple inputs as well, which is cool. I suppose that's the best way of looking at it is because it's a team effort. If like, you know, for example, you with your four employees or four team members, if they're all making a small improvement, then it sort of irks towards your overall yeah. target and stuff which is cool exactly if we all sold an extra deal every month worth five grand um that would be worth i mean let's just work it out now so um that would be 25 times 12 an extra three hundred thousand pounds just by selling one extra deal every month exactly across the five of us so yeah. i mean that's a, and that's a big difference so so they did all of the normal stuff that you would expect you know, a cycling team to do to make improvements pedal. that neither of us yep. know about, right? Like yeah, pedal, pedal, pedal harder, faster, uh, get a better seat, <clears throat> yeah. less butt ache, yeah, um, um, better wheels, better chain, better chain, more gears. Ah. We all know that Sold. more gears That's equals what he faster. He came in and he said, "More gears," and they got the sword out and said, "You are now knighted, sir." Job done. Yeah, who? Job why done. didn't we think of this before? The British cycling team have only had two gears for the last fifty years, and now. We've got five. Yeah. We're in. Yep, yeah, exactly. Simple. Exactly. So they did all of that. They went to five gears. Uh, <laughs> they went to they went to big tyres. They, they basically <laughs> rode penny farthings. That was what happened, right? That's what they've been stuck on for the last 50 years. That's so. it. That's, yeah, they, they were going to specialise and saying, have you got any more of those penny farthings? And they were like, no one else uh, uses those. It's no old. You're at the back Traditional. of the queue. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that struck me, though, as the most memorable thing that they changed was beds and pillows so they started off with all of the kind of normal cycling stuff and then they changed everything they literally looked at everything they totally kept an open mind and one of the things that is most kind of memorable for me is the 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 beds and pillows so normally the team would go around to each kind of event and they would sleep in a hotel right and a hotel is different every every you mm-hmm. know, place you go. They don't all use the same beds. They don't all use the same pillows, etc. And as a result, you'll they'll sleep differently every night. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I feel like I've every time I sleep in an unfamiliar bed, it kind of f's me up a little bit. Yeah. I always feel a little bit, oof, and Sluggish. I never quite get good enough quality well, sleep. Just on that point, so you know, I was explaining I moved earlier. Yeah. <clears throat> For some reason, whenever I move house which I've done a few times. And when I used to rent as well, I'd go between different places. It happens to me on holiday as well. Yeah. Because my brain is unfamiliar with that kind of territory, I don't just have a bad night's sleep. I sleepwalk. So literally... <laughs> Crazy. Last night and the night before, I woke up just walking around the house. I just woke up... Like, oh, last night the, as well? Last night as well, yeah. Crikey. So that familiarity is something that probably really helps because your brain doesn't wander. You're just like, oh, I'm comfortable. This is my yeah. pillow. This is my bed. So. Exactly, exactly. And so what they did which sounds just outlandish right but the marginal gains mm. principle you, you leave no stone unturned they put together and they did loads of research with each athlete and right right what is your best bed what what do you get the best night's sleep in and all of that kind of stuff and they came up with these like bed mattress combinations for each ath- for each athlete and then the day before the riders arrived at the hotel they they would have a team that was sent 
ahead of them, they would take the standard beds out and they would put their beds in. So they'd be sleeping in their beds. You'd feel really bad, though, if you were the person where they kind of tested you and all you ended up with was like a three pound mattress. They were like, that's the the one you sleep best on, mate. You don't need a pillow as well because you're just fine. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Or like, you know, a slab of concrete. Yeah, there's someone that's like, yeah, he doesn't sleep very well. So he's got (laughs) double mattress, this thick. Yeah. You can see on the camera, this thick even. This thick. Yep. He, he, um, for, for those not on the camera, he's uh, gesturing about seven feet. <laughs> uh, so Thick yeah. mattress. Big mattress. So the, another thing that, um, that struck me as interesting was they painted the, uh, the kind of the mechanic area white so that they could see any dust that was on the floor that would impact the, um, the performance of their bikes. The tread. Yeah, or whatever. I don't know. That's like nuts. the gears. Yeah. Imagine being at the end of the race and just saying, look, sorry we came last. It was the dust. Yeah. Well, you say it's nuts, but it's not, right? That dedication to detail yeah. and that kind of relentless process of reviewing and refining and just looking for that 1% so cool. everywhere got that cycling team from where they were to winning 60% of all gold medals at the 2008 Olympics. And four years later, when the Olympic Games came to London, they set nine Olympic records and seven world records. So they went from being a woofy team, yeah. right? In what was that? Uh, eight years, right? They they went from being absolutely, you know, underwhelming and un- and forgettable to being literally the best team that you could possibly be, right? And that was all from that relentless process of finding the 1% everywhere. Mm-hmm. Because if you improve by 1% every day over a year, it's something like 37 times better than where you were yeah. before because of the compound improvement. I mean, the only thing I take away from that is I, I stepped away from when I'd done my research and stuff, I stepped away from the 1% because how do you put a percent on, ab, uh, you know, there's probably some mathematicians that will listen to this and go, you definitely can. But how do you apply like a 1% principle to everything you do? I was thinking about like when we go climbing, how could we improve our climbing by 1% each time? You know, you're climbing up a wall. There's not, you know, you haven't got a measurement for like, well, there's five holds. Yeah, At the moment, I, I can only do one. Yeah. It's like, but it's really cool. Like in terms of we could now go in there and say, right, as of next week, we want to go one hold extra on whatever climb that is yeah. and just start actually noting it down, which is wicked. I think it's, it's, the, <clears throat> it's less about the percentage and more yeah. about what the percentage represents. Exactly. It represents a very, very small incremental improvement. And so to use your, and we'll talk about climbing in a minute mm. because that is something that inspired. Yeah. Uh, in, I saw your notes and you wrote about climbing and actually, yeah. Bloody hell, that would be, this would be the, the absolute right process to apply to this. But yeah. in that example, it's like, well, now we're going to focus on weight distribution. We're going to focus on how we, um, how we distribute our weight on a particular hold and, and look at how that might improve things rather than just climbing up, right? Yeah, exactly. And just doing the climb and maybe doing it wrong or not doing it the best way, thinking about, okay, how can we look at each little component of what makes up climbing a, a climb and improve a little bit of that every time we go. And so, sure. yeah, I, I think that that dedic and this is something that really kind of just speaks to me in such a core visceral way because of all of the, re- the daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly reviews that I do, I'm always looking at where could I be better? Like mm. where, what part of each interaction or each thing that I do could I improve? Um, and even if I'm looking at just a little bit of improvement, that's fine, Right. Because you add up all of those little improvements and they become meaningful and significant. So um, that is the background, the context um, to marginal gains. I, I hope that everyone li- <laughs> listening is just as excited as I am about the kind of the uh, principle and the philosophy off of it. their floors so they can run faster. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, paint all of your f- floors white so you can see the dust. And so that's that's all you need to do. You get to work 5% quicker. Yeah. That's and our guarantee. Take your pillow everywhere with you. Yep. Do you know what? Actually, I do do that every now and again. So when when I go and stay at um, you know my family's uh, or whatever it might be, which, which I did for the first time in ages and we didn't do this this time. When you have your spare room, you don't put your best pillows in your spare room, right? That's not something that you do. Correct. Because you want your best pillows. Whereas in my house, I've got my best pillow on my bed. And in, in, in the spare room, if, if, you know, if we had one still, um, that would, you would have the, just the regular default. old pillows, the default, the, the standard Ikea pillows. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, it sounds like even, you're describing my spare room at the moment. Not even Ikea. Yeah, it would be 
you know, as the smart price. <laughs> so why don't if I'm driving somewhere, why don't I just take my pillow with me? Because I then get to sleep in my delightful memory foam, the one that I'm just so used to. That's what people want to see. You just with your pillow under your armpit say, I'm here to stay. Yeah. <laughs> So I mean, you're, you're I'm not. I'm not precious. They're like, oh, are our pillows not good enough for you? It's like, I no, no. I, w- I wasn't sure. <laughs> no, I don't know. But I you don't also know don't want to text your are. friend before you go around and say, just send me a pillow. Uh, send me a picture of your pillows. Or, yeah. What brand is yeah, it? What brand is it? And yeah. It's like going to give me a neck ache in the morning. You just <laughs> exactly. don't know. Do you? Do you know, I had um, when when we stayed in uh, Bournemouth uh, the other week, um, the pillows that they had there were really, really, really soft like really soft so we rang down and asked for firmer pillows because me and Kaylee we both have firm pillows and so that's what we're used to mm. and they were like yeah here you go here's your firm pillows and they were just just as soft <laughs> as what was on the bed and so we're like oh god like this is a nightmare and so yeah we just we, we had, had the to holiday sleep like, from hell <laughs> it, it wasn't it wasn't bad it's just we're very very like light sleepers it has to, our conditions have to be kind of just right in order mm. for us to get a good night's sleep most of our conversations are bloody hell, I'm well tired I didn't get a lot of sleep last mm. night because of x and y conditions weren't optimal it's just I guess it's one of the things about well, getting older I'm the same to be honest when it comes to sleeping unless I'm absolutely foobard like last few days I've been going to sleep and just knocking out but then obviously yeah. getting up and sleepwalking and stuff but Kerry will just flat out she'll lie face down and just <laughs> gone not moving i envy people that yeah. can do that because i you know i've talked about this a lot on the show um i do struggle with the kind of with getting that i think so let, restful let me sleep, restful said, sleep mm. evades me all the time and i think i'm at a point now where this is just what life is i'm just t- you know you get to that I'm point in life tired yeah i'm just I tired can't do it anymore. yeah I'm, well no i'm i'm still i'm still fighting fit i'm still <laughs> uh, you know i'm still getting that to de- getting at the day but i i find that i've now just resolved myself to the fact that i'm this is just how normal is supposed to yeah. feel like <laughs> the thing is the quality of sleep is the main problem yeah. here right because you're not gonna get that extra like even if you stay in and lay in a couple a couple more hours doesn't help. it does exactly i'm doesn't in the same help. situation so I'll, I'll be up at five or six and i still feel the same amount yeah. tired or if i get up at 10 i kind of feel the same <laughs> i like, feel worse if yeah. i sleep more like, i haven't had a lay in for months if no. not years now so. no i mean i woke up today at like <clears throat> six and it was that was like half an hour later than what i've been doing for the whole week that's when and, i was uh, prepping my show notes because i had to tether to a I don't have internet in my house for those people watching right now. And it's that's been, why we're here. <laughs> yeah, that's, why, that's literally why we're face to face. I mean, I'm enjoying it. It's, it's a different vibe. But yeah. that is what ultimately why we were here because I don't have internet. So in the end, I had to type up my show notes tethered to my phone downstairs, just hunched over at six in the morning, just like, I need to get something prepped. So that's why your research is far more thorough. I didn't know that stuff about the painted floor and I'm enjoying it. I'm I mean, learning. One of the reasons why I this is... Uh, I know all of mm. a lot of this already is because this um, I originally found out about this and I'll just share this and then we'll move on. Um, I originally found out about this from a corporate event that we had at work probably about f- four years ago, mm. um, maybe three years ago. Um, and marginal gains and the story of Sir David Brailsford was kind of, you know, pitched to us at this corporate event. And, um, it was we were given the the objective to find one percent in our process and in our lives and in our yeah. kind of working environment to to try and find that extra that extra amount of order intake essentially like how can we what can we do differently to get more out of the same essentially is what you're yeah because you could Definitely. just sell more you could just do more you could just work longer hours but <laughs> that's, that's, that's not... how sales works isn't it yeah you just do more. do more yeah yeah have you considered making more money yes yes, yes. yeah have you considered selling <laughs> more deals well yeah um but it doesn't work it doesn't quite... <laughs> yeah. so you have to you have to be you know you have to do it in in a creative way and think about things outside of the box so um I will come back to that in a tick because I, when I share some of my examples of implementing marginal gains, but um, I'd quite, I'd be really interested to hand it over to you and, mm. and hear about now that we've kind of explained this is what the marginal gains kind of principle is, how you might have even inadvertently, because this is quite a new concept yeah, to, yeah. to you, um, implemented this sort of thing in your professional, personal life, whatever it might be. 
And uh, yeah, so I'd be keen to hear your story, Dan. Yeah, well, I, it's, it's cool that you use the word inadvertently because that is exactly it. I didn't realise. Yeah. I woke up this morning and the first thing I wrote <clears throat> on my show notes was, I don't do it. I've never heard of it. <laughs> Marginal gain sounds cool. I don't do it. But I, I, don't, I don't have stats and I go, oof, let me just increase that by 1% or anything. But then I sat down and I was like, in episode 15, I waffled on for an hour and a half maybe. No, in fact, that was edited. Maybe like two hours of just talking about the automation that I've done, right? That was an interesting edit. Yes. Yeah. So I've I've spent two hours talking about the stuff I've automated and all of those are marginal gains towards giving me back my time. Um, like if we look at what I've done, um, I, I just have so much that's running weekly, monthly, daily that it yeah. all equates to giving me so much free time back. I'm off work this week because I was moving house um, and all of my stuff has been running. So people have been doing my work for me. Um, in the sense that it takes the document and just sends it to them. So I've been on holiday, but people have been just cracking on with the stuff that I normally do. So it's like, well, actually, I'm adding value by not even working at the moment, which is cool. Um, Also, in terms of marginal gains, me and Kerry set up a savings pot last week. And the way it was going to work is that we were just going to put a tenner in every week. So it's a very small amount for, you know, considering you'd go and get coffee, you'd get food. You just put £10 in that pot each. Yeah. And I was just saying to Kerry, after like a month, we'll see how we get on. You, you're not even going to notice it go. And then before you know it, you either double it. Yeah. It's like just under a grand a year. So it's not like a huge Boom. amount of savings. But it's like it, if we just keep putting into that, when it comes to like buying presents or yeah. you know, when Christmas comes around, we're just going to have an extra grand to just splash on what we want. Yeah, And true. especially if you do like a couple of months, and you're like, I don't even notice that it's a recurring payment. Just then another tenner in. And then before you know it, you could just be putting 100 quid in a month. Uh, each or 100 quid a week or whatever it is and then you just you know you've got a bigger savings pot and you yeah because that's the thing people get worried they're like I, I need to save and it's such a small amount but if you just build it up bit by bit you don't tend to notice it yeah if i said joe can you give me you know a five each week you you know you'd probably say why but if you were just Cash giving me a five each week you would just go yep here's a yeah. fiver and then if i just said oh actually could i get six pounds a week you're not really gonna bat an eyelid no it's a quid It'd be a bit strange to give to give an adult a coin though. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, any, giving a giving an adult anything less than like a note of money is a bit of a strange. Yeah. It makes me feel a little uncomfortable. If I had to give you like two quid, it would be like, yeah, he like what is this pocket Where's money? It come from? Like, what? Yeah. yeah, well, I I don't I have a a jar full of like old coins from. I don't know how long ago yep. they've even got like the old pound coin in that you can't even get exchanged anymore. But yeah, you that's my rainy melt day. Melt it down fund. and turn it into some jewelry. And why not? Um, intermittent fasting was a marginal gain for me. Yeah, yeah. It was such a small change to literally when you say it out loud, all it is is eating a bit later. That's it. Yeah. Such a small change. Like you can't put a percentage on it, but it's such a small change for such drastic results mm. in terms of losing weight and just feeling less sluggish. And you know if i'd have said you know what, i'm just going to start eating healthy that's like a massive gain to be like i need to stop eating crap yeah as opposed to just going i need to just eat a bit later and maybe start off with something healthy yeah tick tick yeah <laughs> it's yeah. quite easy um but th- those are kind of the only things i've done um i didn't kind of when i'd done the automation i didn't kind of wake up and just say you know good morning everyone i'm just going to automate everything and goodbye thank you yeah i woke up and i thought what can i automate like there's a daily email that goes out from an engineer at our place and it says like log out of these systems it's just like a reminder and for months people have just been doing that at the end at like i don't know what time it is but at some point in the afternoon they send an email and say guys remember to log out the system and that might take someone five seconds to do even 10 seconds but they have to remember to do that um they have to sort of have a reminder to go right i need to send an email out to the team so they've got open outlook <laughs> type in the email address subject and then just say you know log out systems so i just looked at that and i was like oh, i could save everyone maybe like 10 seconds a day i automated that email it goes out even when i'm off same time every day yeah spot on so it's like that's about just, as marginal as you can get but yeah, that exactly. is the, the exact point of the whole thing it's like well where, what can we do to give someone back 10 seconds so they can go and be doing something else and and actually it's probably in terms of like the cognitive load of remembering to do that, then putting it together and then you know, remembering that it's the similar format and all mm-hmm. of that. It may only be 10 seconds in terms of time, but the cognitive load up until that point is probably worth a lot more. Exactly. So it's things yeah. like that. that. And that's my point though. When you speak to management and stuff and you're like, I'm automating that, they just kind of go, oh, right. 
does does it need to be automated and it's like well probably if it can be why yeah. not and that's my point is like i've been doing all those little things and they the thing is with automation and stuff you get people that go from zero to a thousand yeah like you say oh, i'm gonna work on some automation and they're like so could you automate like my car just driving me home <laughs> and like with complete a complete serious face yeah. it's like so if you can automate like an email going out can you automate like an email that goes out when i get in my car and starts my car for me and then drives me home and sends an email back to say that i've got home and it's like I you mean, can do some of that to yeah be fair, some of it but... but it's like well why why yeah exactly <laughs> whereas you focus on the small wins and as you said it, it you know all slots in together and you've made you've saved six hours a week on just doing little tasks yeah that was the whole point and when when i started looking into it just the quote itself small changes produce big results that's marginal gains right and yeah. there's loads of small changes with automation and that's the thing you kind of look at it and you think well some of this stuff could be considered pointless but mm. then the people that are actively doing that work are saving so much time all in all so yeah i think that's really cool i'm sorry my watch has just been buzzing off i'm trying to put it on do not disturb that's all right nice what about yourself so um a lot of my so i've done lots and lots of different marginal games there's some that i will share today i think i've got three that i want to kind of share like mm -hmm. fundamental ones um and this is more like around process rather than like tactical marginal gains and so for me there's two that are all about the kind of questions that i ask in a yeah. sales process that um have really really kind of they've basically like 10 x my predictability in terms of when a when a deal is going to happen mm -hmm. because i just ask better questions and refining the quality of my questions has, has just got me to that point so i'll give you a couple of examples so my first example in the before times not before covid but before this marginal gain deals would always be kind of slipping around in my in my world and and sometimes they would just drop out completely as a complete surprise but i'd forecasted it and said yeah yeah that'll happen and uh then the customer would go well, actually no we're not going to do it and it's and it's like my, my initial feeling was a feeling of frustration toward the situation and you know arguably towards the customer but actually it was my fault because i wasn't asking good high quality enough questions to no way to look at it to to, to arrive at a an accurate outcome of an accurate out understanding of the situation and so you know that was holding me back in terms of getting to the next stage of my kind of development and mm -hmm. arguably the next stage of my career so there are a couple of questions that i introduced that were game changing and it was just asking an extra question mm -hmm. or an extra two questions that then completely changed the game and uh you know right at the start of the process the first that one of the questions that i introduced was so let's say we can meet your requirements mr customer and we prove that to you as part of this process so let's just you know let's be optimists and say that that, ha that happens thanks for meeting the requirements joe yep thank <laughs> you big tick and then let's say that when we look at the numbers the numbers look okay as well and so yep big green tick there so once we get to that point in the process is there anything that will hold you back from moving forward then? And it sounds so e such like such an obvious question, right? But people don't ask it. They I'm just not, assume yeah. that, well, if the numbers are right and the requirement is there, it's then they'll happen. buy it, right? Yeah. That's not always the case. It's just not the case sometimes because you might not be speaking to the right person. You might not be, you know, they might think the numbers are right, but they might not just, they just might not have the budget, right? Or they might not have, the buy-in from the business yeah. in they order to execute. They might have to, to take execute. back the, the numbers and say, right, and then they've got other people that are going to, vent, going exactly. to tender for it as well. And and say, yeah. Exactly. It might be a competitive scenario, so it's not necessarily a sure bet. So at that point, the, the answer to that question is pretty much always, I don't think so. And so it's like, okay, so they've not actually given it much thought, but you've kind of qualified, okay, well, they've not offered up well, actually, we need to go to this person. We do yeah. need to look at other options. And actually, it needs. To, we're going to be planning on doing this in 2023 rather than 2020. So it's like, well, hang on a minute there. The world is a lot different to what I was expecting where yeah, yeah. you prove the requirement, you, the numbers are right, you buy the thing. You know, it's not always that simple. And so my follow-up to that would be, and I, I paint the picture. So I say, okay, well, that's great. So if at that point I put the contract to you for signing 
so we've you know as i say we've proved that the value we've mm -hmm. you know the numbers work the requirement fits and so i put together the contract that's usually the next step and i put that to you is that something that you could sign at that point and then you're putting the pen in the person's hand yeah and so you then kind of flush out do well it. actually i'm not the person that's going to sign that it's not actually me that does the signing I've got to take it to Bob Jones, who's the CFO or whatever, or the CEO. I do like Bob Jones, um, yeah. And actually, in order to to get us to that point, we need consensus of you know five other people in the business as well. So you've you've gone from assuming, because assuming makes an ass out of you and me. me. <laughs> you've gone from assuming that the, the requirement is there, the numbers are there, they'll buy the thing, to understanding this whole other kind of buying cycle that that the customer needs to go through in order to kind of get you. To, to the end goal that ultimately you do both want to get to, right? And so there's lots of questions like that that I've put into my process that kind of evolved over time and I'm trying to tweak the way that I've asked them to be sometimes more specific, sometimes less specific. Yeah. Um, asking questions with more specificity, 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 specificity whatever, yeah. with more specificness, <laughs> right? Means that you, they, in order to answer the question, they have to kind of answer it with that specificity with that level it, of, which... of kind of detail and accuracy and the biggest challenge in sales arguably the biggest challenge in sales is understanding how the client buys mm -hmm. and when they're going to be in a position to buy yeah so it's understand you know sales processes aren't complicated buying processes are complicated so my my process for selling something is find a requirement this how much prove, it's gonna cost. prove the solution prove you have a solution to the requirement get them to sign it that's kind of the the broad you know the broad brush of it right yeah find yeah, but that's like saying space travel is just you know getting a rocket fly up into space true Tick. <laughs> exactly but there's a lot the, of spinning the, parts yeah there's lots of spinning parts but the spinning parts are typically on the other side yeah they're typically on the buyer side rather than on the sales side right um i don't have to go through umpteen levels of approval mm -hmm. in order to to do my job but in order for a client to buy something, they might have to go through umpteen levels of approval. So the questioning is is so kind of important. And that's kind of some of the marginal gains that I've kind of just used to refine my questioning over time um, is is kind of crucial to, to me being as effective as I've been over the last kind of you know, couple of years or so. So I've got another example of, of, of questioning that um, that is kind of probably been the biggest the biggest sort of shift change and that's the question is there any reason why this wouldn't happen and i kind of dovetail that into the first question where 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 and i use that at every point in the process it's like right you know you're taking this for approval you're yeah, taking yeah. this to the board um so but but you're really confident that it's going to happen etc is there any reason why that wouldn't happen is there any reason why you'd get a no and then it's like it's at that this is a similar reason to the other to the other kind of questioning the, the kind of the signing process adding this question in my view gives you a barometer of what objections could come up now or could come up kind of later on down the line that I you're going to need to well, overcome it's not necessarily just about the objections right it gives you a like as you said about the barometer you know what kind of person they are and whether they're a committed person and whether they're positive because yeah. if they turn around and they're like look i have to speak to someone but I'm pretty confident. Yeah, you can at least take that back to to your side and say, right, well, they are pretty confident, and put that in, you know, put a tick in the box that says this is likely, but not well, not impossible. <laughs> in in my uh, so I would ask in it, so I would used to, uh, that would be the way I would do it yeah, five yeah. years ago. But are oh, they confident? It's like, well, I need to be confident, yeah. and so I probably dig a little deeper and ask, is there any reason that you can think of why this wouldn't happen? It's like, well, yeah, you know, we might not get the budget approved, we might, yeah, we might not this, we might not that, we might not the other. Mm -hmm. There's more than like a handful of things that would mean that this won't happen. I'm less confident yeah, because yeah. he might, he or she might be confident, um, but lots of customers have a, have happy ears, lots of, and they don't want to say, nah, yeah, I'm not sure about this, Joe. They want to go. I think we're we're in a great place. They're excited, yeah. and so they're feeling positive. But they might get absolutely kicked down the kicked, um, you know, to the curb by the rest of the business. So there's. Uh, it's an interesting I, question. I used that when I was trying to buy the house. That's all I was saying to my solicitor. Is like, yeah. look, because everyone's confident at that point. Look, I'm confident we can get it in before stamp yeah. duty. I'm confident the person's going to buy your house. But in the UK system, it's like, well, people can say I'm going to buy your house for X amount, and then right until the point of the contracts being exchanged, they could be like, actually maybe not see you later 
So it's like one of those. You There's like no question, penalty yeah, for doing that exactly. either. It's crazy. And th- those are the sort of questions. Instead of going in there and be like, when, when? Like, tell yeah. me when it's going to happen. You just ask those sort of questions. Like, is it, you know, is there anything we're waiting on? Or is there any reason what, you know, any reason why we might not be able to move? Because I'd already started yeah. packing up my stuff at this point and I thought, if it doesn't go my way, like I'm, I'm out of pocket, maybe yeah. not by thousands, but... It's the emotional toll that it takes on you. I had yeah, hair oh, yeah. before we started doing this <coughs> six yeah, weeks ago. Yeah, yeah you were hair. you were a happy-go-lucky, um, excitable, happy guy before you decided. You know, what, I'm gonna I'm gonna move house again, and then uh, you changed forever, Dan. I know. It, it <laughs> happened. It, it happened out of nowhere as well, didn't it? You were there when we decided. Yeah, it was. I we were just walking around a a, a pond. Or a lake, actually. It, yeah. was, it wasn't a pond. It was a big lake. And you were like, you know, I think we just might might move. And I ended up, I was, I was waiting in line with Kerry to um, grab a sausage roll in that cafe. Oh, yeah, yeah. And she, and, and she was like, oh, I'm trying to convince him to move, you know, somewhere around here and stuff. And I was like, yeah, you absolutely should, you know. And you should move to, you know, further out of where you were but you didn't need to move up to Scotland or whatever. Mm. There's lots of nice places around um, the area that we are. Um, And then, yeah, from there, you then decided like the next day, yeah, we're going to move. And then the rest was history. That was literally And that wasn't even that long ago. Kerry came out and said, Joe said you should move. And I said, what? She said, Joe said you should move. And I was like, oh, okay. well, I have to now. <laughs> I have to now. That's it. That's it. You know, I'm very good at convincing people to do things. It's kind of what I do for a job. So, um, so Jedi mind powers. Yeah, you yeah, will move it. house. No, I won't. There's no, you will move house. That's what I do. That's all I do. I just do the little wavy hand thing. And then people are like, oh, well, maybe I will. Yeah. It's been a lot harder on teams because I have to get my hand in front of my oh, face yeah. in order for them to, exactly. uh, to do it. So moving on from kind of, current gains current marginal gains one thing i wanted to explore with you which i think would be quite interesting is where do we think we could implement future marginal gains in our lives to be more effective and i'm not just thinking about work because um yeah we talk about work quite a lot but you know where else could we implement the principle of marginal gains to Mm. um to, to to the betterment of our our lives um, one thing you mentioned earlier, you kind of gave some foreshadowing to, it, is the is the climbing side of yeah, things. Yeah. So I'd be keen for you to kind of you know tell us what you think in there, um, and then you know I'll kind of explain kind of where my head's at in terms of future marginal gains, and that's probably where we'll wrap up. To be yeah, fair, sounds good. I think let's um, let's just have an open discussion. Let's plan what we're going to do with climbing and stick to it. Yeah. So uh, I've got two places. Like for me, work wise, like I know we we said we kind of talk about work a lot, but for me, the work cycle is just going to continually be marginal gains because yeah. i'm i'm going to continue automating stuff as it comes in it takes me a bit longer at the start to get it automated but anything that i get assigned that, that is repeatable i just do it yeah so the next time it comes in i go well i've got a document for that um, and it happens the same time every week or the same time every year i mean i work in reactive work so it doesn't always work that way yeah but it frees me up to deal with the stuff that does come in instead of you know going through and finding documents and rewriting them and process guides and all that sort of stuff mm. but the actual marginal gains I want to apply now are all around exercise. I'm not particularly unhealthy. I'm probably the healthiest I've been. I don't, you know, I don't drink anymore. Yeah. I live a strict, I eat a strict vegetarian diet. I'm, I, to be fair, I've been eating out quite a lot recently because I don't know where my plates are. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but from like an exercise standpoint, I, ha- I have no excuse now. Like I, I should get fit. I've yeah. got really nice lake behind my house. I've got loads of walking areas. Um, and the biggest thing is I have a gym that's not even like a five minute walk. It's a minute and a half, two minute walk. Oh, no way. Um, and it's a pay as you go gym. So I'm like, I can't, I don't have any excuse. Like even to just stop work on a lunch break and go down there and do some weightlifting or something. Same with climbing. It's an eight minute drive or something now. So it's like, I, I really don't have any excuse. Yeah. If I can't get up and go in the morning because something comes up, I can go in the evening. Whereas before it was like kind of hard to do. So like my marginal gains, I'm definitely going to apply to exercising. Because if I even go one minute a week to the gym, that's better than I've been doing at the moment. Because yeah. my gym before was like a 10, 15 minute drive. So by the time I get there, I can maybe do 20 minutes exercise and get back in the car, go back because I've got to, um, like I've got to get back to work. Yeah. I can't do it on my lunch break. Whereas now I can just swap my, my shorts, my t-shirt and just jog it down and I'm in the gym. Yeah. Um, yeah so absolutely. yeah, I'm going to do little bits at the start. Like I'll start doing a short workout and then just build it up and maybe try some swimming, try all that sort of stuff. Um, I haven't got any like um, 
you know measurements in terms of like i'm not going to be like i want my biceps to increase by one inch no and i think that that's where that's where you'll fail yeah exactly. because one of the things that i've learned over the years i'm gonna sneeze live on camera <sighs> caught on candid camera <laughs> i've even taken my antihistamine as well so one of the things i've learned over the years is to focus on inputs and not outputs and i've talked about this a yeah, lot yeah. in previous Themes episodes well, isn't it? yeah to put to put it to put it another way focus on systems not goals so you've got to be as obsessed about the process of the mm -hmm. thing you're doing as you are about the outcome in order to find the kind of the internal motivation to continually strive for excellence so you focusing on getting your biceps you know another you know inch and a half in i don't know measurements for biceps as, <laughs> that's as what i said as soon as i started like, talking i was like, hang on a minute i have no idea i can see my arms on the camera and i think hang on a minute <laughs> yeah exactly i mean we've been climbing three times a week for the last i don't know few months all i still suffer from arms. is this look if, if people are watching on the cameras those oh yeah the calluses climbers and hands. Stuff. yeah but um yeah you've got to be kind of obsessed with the craft mm. rather than just like what the craft gives you in terms of outcomes so you've got a and that's hard to do sometimes, right? It's it's that commitment to the process that's hard to find, but that is so much more valuable than kind of motivation by outcomes and by goals well, yeah, and stuff. A hundred percent. So I think from a climbing perspective, we need to work out what our goals are. We're at the moment climbing like V one to V three, which is still beginner, yeah. but it's like off top top end of beginner stuff. Yeah. So. And uh, we do a couple of two fours, but I, I, this is the thing I'm kind of thinking about. And it's like, what do I do? Change my pillow, change my shoes again. Because when we got new shoes, we were smashing those climbs because yeah. we were confident in the grip and stuff like that. Which you'd think would be the opposite because you, the longer you have the shoes, the more trust you can put in them. Put I in, think yeah, we'll probably focus on technique is probably the next step for us yeah. because we, we just bosh it pretty much based on kind of pure Brute like strength. strength. And um, when... When I watch some other people climb, they do these little things, which I'm like, oh, I wonder what that is. And it's about being curious about being better. And uh, I think that's probably where we would we would benefit from focusing. So rather than just boshing a load of climbs, maybe we fo fixate on like one run and then work out what is the most efficient way of doing it using a particular technique, yeah. right? And so we pick a technique and then we try and refine it and, and, and perfect it. And then we can add that to our kit bag of things when we do other climbs. It's like, okay, well, I'll use this kind of, you know, the leg thing that people yeah, do yeah. where they stick their leg out and, and use it as use like a counterbalance. Stuff, yeah. um, I mean, there's also the point of like just maybe at the start of each session, just doing a chin up, whatever it is, on the bar. Just and then one, doing, yeah. yeah. And then Single. the week after, try and do two. And then before you know it, you're doing 15 chin ups before you start even climbing. Yeah. Um, so stuff like that, I think we should try and implement. Yeah, I think it's a good shout. And I think equally, you know, I think just to kind of final finalize my point before we move on, mm. um, I think we've spent a lot of time kind of building up core strength yeah, and just general strength of holding yourself up on a wall and climbing to the point where you don't fall off, right? Yeah. That's kind of broadly where we've got to. I and suppose I think, our, the our thesis at the moment is that we just climb up as fast as we can and jump down because yeah. it's agony. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we want to try and get to a point where we're getting under the skin of some of the techniques a little bit more and tweaking those bits. I think we've got to a plateau where um that's how we move forward mm. um but i'm excited about trialing different things and learning more about the craft yeah S getting excited about the craft exactly things, rather than be just awesome. being able to climb up stuff you know um i think for me when it comes to things that i'm going to focus on in the future aside from climbing because i think you know that's really my primary kind of form of exercise and uh actually doing some more exercise outside of climbing on my kind of off days is probably a good a good thing because the only strength training I do is when I'm actually climbing up a wall yeah, and I should probably do to your mouth. and doing yeah yep. exactly um and I should probably do some additional bits and pieces in order to kind of bet further benefit me when I do climb um from a from a work point of view I'm going to push some more document automation and so you know this is probably where I'll tap you up for some <laughs> for some guidance. To be fair, yeah, I, I've 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 done some already, but I want to make it even more automated. So I kind of explain briefly what I've done. So basically, I I have a lots of template proposal documentation mm -hmm. that um you, you know it's got a lot of like X's on it where you put the client name in and stuff like that, and I want to try and do something where 
it asks you for the client name and the version number and all of this kind of stuff and it just like populates the template for you um and then job done at the moment it's text fields that i need to then over type do you know what you should do though is just as a quick point on that is just put something like dollar sign client name dollar sign yeah so then you can just do a well on apple find and replace it's, yeah find and replace on yeah, those because that's what i've done it's like for when we bring on a new client, for example, if I'm looking through the document and it's being repurposed for another client, yeah. I just do control H and then replace it with, so I'll replace dollar client name dollar with the client name. And then if it's like technology, I'll do dollar technology because then it's like okay. specific enough that you're not going to replace anything else. Yeah. And then you can go through and do all of the replacements in one go. That's a good idea. Yeah. So even because you can do the inputs one and I do that. So like we have a an RFC, like a request for change template. And now if somebody wants it, I just say, send me the client name, the reference and the type of work it is. And then I type that in my app. It says, what is it? And I put it in the specific order and it generates the document and then asks for their email. Right. Gotcha. So I can then put their email address and whatever. Okay. Um, and it sends it straight out to them. So instead of them finding the template, downloading it, removing the info, yeah. I just will enter it in for them. Okay. Um, but I don't tend to do much with document manipulation in terms of the contents of documents because it just can be a bit finicky. And that's yeah. where... There's like a chart that you can look at, but you've got to work out how much time creating that input is going to give you from the output. Yeah. And I found that working out how to do it, I'm not a developer, so I'm not, you know, I'm not amazing at that sort of stuff. Like the uh, the platform I built is just automated document management. Yeah. Um, and when it came to trying to develop something that does that, it was taking me so long yeah. that I just thought I'm, I'm actually wasting time now. I'm just oh, burning really? time. Okay. So, but there's definitely ways around it. And one of those is the control H function because you yeah. still get your template and it's, like if you do the automated document management, you'd get it with the client name. So you could do like an input box that says um, like you've got a proposal and it's like proposal for client. Who's You just ask yourself, who's the client you put in? Yeah. Joe Page Industries. And then when you hit enter, it renames the document. It says Joe Page Industries underscore proposal underscore date or something like that. Yeah. So then the document's there and all you have to do is open it and do control H and do Joe Page yeah. Industries. Yeah. I think that that will base, that will take me that'll get me a lot further than where I'm at at the moment, to be yeah. fair. Um, and so that kind of dovetails quite nicely into the, the second kind of marginal gain that I want to, I want to implement is, is I want to share a lot of that system, those systems, my systems mm -hmm. with my team. Yeah. And, you know, encourage them where I can to adopt the bits that work for them. How good is it if all your teams are using the exact same proposal? Exactly. So it's like, you know, I don't want to sound ridiculous, but it's just like having a load of mini U so everyone's doing the same thing that you've been doing because that's obviously got proven results, right? Yeah. So you've got, to, just... you've got to sing the tune your own way to a degree. Yeah. But if there's like consistent documentation that um, they can use really easily, that just removes the, the cruft of the work and just gets them focusing on the real value stuff, then that can only be a good thing, right? Correct. Um, and I know that I'm a massive nerd, so I'm always thinking about, okay, you know, automation and, mm. and you know, doing it in a techie kind of way. Um, but a lot of my colleagues are already using my documents. And so if I can make those better, then as a team, as a division, as a company, those, that, those, mar <clears throat> those marginal gains are going to kind of cascade up Mm -hmm. and become more valuable than the amount of time that I put in just exactly. putting dollar sign client name into into a few documents. And so the quicker we can, the objective really there is because the quicker we can do the follow-up, which is the proposal mm -hmm. and all the things like that, the, the absolute better because time kills all deals. Yep. The more time you have between an engagement and the follow-up, the 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 worse mm -hmm. you know that's just a, a, it, time kills all deals that's just the best way of putting it so um i think for me that's where i'm going to be kind of focusing my efforts in the next kind of the next kind of you know few weeks and uh yeah i'll, I'll let you know how it yeah, gets awesome. how, how we, how we get, on with get out of it will be tremendous like yeah for me i've got it to a point with one of our clients um where they've got a load of scheduled maintenance throughout the year and it's right. every year so we do like reboots of certain servers nice and the process used to be like one of the uh, managers would drop a, an email into our support desk and say this needs to be done mm -hmm. and then that person would go and find the document download it fill it in with all the survey uh, server information um, get that approved by the client and say right this is what we want to do can you approve that we do it yeah um, this is when we want to do it whoever it is and now when that happens my automation grabs the document for that specific piece of work for the day it's supposed to be planned not the day it's supposed to go ahead 
um, sends it into the support desk and it's got that attached to it and says, right, all you need to do is put your name on it. So oh, they right, put their okay. name on it and they send it to the client. It's already approved. I spoke to the client and got all of the processes approved. Right. So all of the server names are in it, all of the processes in terms of how it's done is approved. So they just basically go, yeah, we'll do it for next Friday. And Brilliant. then somebody just gets it done and dusted. Yeah. And that the amount that that saved, not just me, that's anyone in the team, because if that gets assigned to them now, they don't have to look for it and go, right, what, you know, what server are they rebooting? What's the host name? What's the IP address? Yeah, yeah. They it's just the whole... go, right, I'll put my name on it and I'll do the work or Bosh. give it to someone else. So you could do that almost with like the proposal kind of thing, which is cool. Yeah, exactly. That's Loads kind of, of stuff. Yeah, that that's kind of my, my general thinking is that we get a standard template agreed by the business, mm. which... Um, which does all of the you know, covers all the points and and has all of the eventualities in it, and then we give that out to the team so that rather than someone taking half a day to write a proposal, they just chuck the client name in this template, pick the bits that they need, delete the bits that they don't, bosh it out to the client, job done. Yeah. So the, literally when you say done. about deleting the bits they don't need, just make that gone as a, as the template, which is what yeah. why it's so easy because basically some anyone that even if they're a new person they could be you know shit hot at speaking to the clients and yeah. getting the deals but then the, their documentation might be subpar some people are just like that some people are really good at selling but they're crap at filling in documents because yeah. they're always too busy out there selling yeah whereas you give them that opportunity to just go here's my template right put my name <laughs> put <Yeah>. the money <laughs> well the, the the idea being is that if we can make that take less time they can spend more time finding more deals exactly and and you know engaging with customers and delivering value because doing doing a proposal which is broadly a hodgepodge of other templates is it's arguably not valuable or arguably less valuable mm -hmm. in comparison to spending time with clients understanding their problems and finding solutions to them um, which you know helps helps the customer because they're getting their problem solved which is great and if that then Earns, earns a crust on off the back of it then even better everybody wins right exactly um Small putting changes. together documentation that you know i would always kind of be a bit skeptical in terms of saying with absolute certainty that customers read every piece of documentation that their suppliers provide them no but... i said it with my tongue in my cheek a little bit because <laughs> I, they probably just scroll down to where the money is and go oh right it's going to cost that much well, that's the but... point if you've got an agreed template you're confident with what you're sending instead exactly. of somebody having to go through as you said like the the craft of it and going right making sure i've got the right legal details on it making exactly. sure i'm putting the right numbers and all this sort of stuff whereas now you could just go right i'm confident in 99 percent of the document yeah the one percent that you filled in the marginal gains the marginal <laughs> the gains one percent you filled in i'm happy with now yeah, because yeah it says money on it and it's got your signature whatever it is i don't know how proposals work i'm not yeah in that area but doesn't have a signature but <laughs> yeah i get what you, you you're broadly there it says you've got these problems Show this me is the money, this yeah. is how we're going to solve it and this is how much it's going to cost that's it nice. basically that's yeah. what a proposal is um cool have you got any further final thoughts dan on marginal gains before we go grab another coffee downstairs no, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy with how this has turned out like, i mean maybe the recording will come out crap but it being face to face is so much easier to have a conversation with no latency and stuff like yeah. that so i think maybe we try and make this a more regular thing it makes for better content for both of us absolutely well. i'm sure kaylee would love that as well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she could just hear both of our dulcet tones from the room next door <laughs> we can also do it in mine now so yeah absolutely we can do um we can uh sometimes it'll be here sometimes it'll be there you know maybe we could even go and do it in a i don't know in a starbucks or something Oof. i bet you they'd love that 